thank God that we can continue to hear from His Word. We have begun yesterday on the laws of uncleanness and the distinction that is made between what is clean and what is unclean, what is edible and what is abominable. And the question naturally would be raised, how should Gentile Christians view these Jewish laws? This was the question that needed to be answered by the Jerusalem church. For in the book of Acts, there were Jews who thought that it is necessary for Gentile Christians to conform to Jewish laws. And therefore, Paul and Barnabas had to be sent by the church in Antioch to clarify this truth. This is appropriate for us to consider so that we may read these ceremonial laws as Gentiles and understand what we ought to learn from it. So we shall be taking a slight detour and we'll be going to the book of Acts. We'll go to the book of Acts first and Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15 and verses 1 to 35. Acts chapter 15 verses 1 to 35 and we shall see the scene of the Jerusalem council and how it was resolved. Acts chapter 15 verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which know of the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon have declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return, and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works, from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not, trouble not them, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of all time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then please it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. 
the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard, the certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemeth good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words, and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. How wonderful this is. We as Gentile Christians are free from the performance of the ceremonial law, but have been given four necessary things to do. To abstain from meat offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. And this is what the apostles and elders in Jerusalem decided that the Gentiles should do. Let us therefore follow it and learn to rejoice as the church of Antioch did upon receiving this epistle. But how should we use this liberty that we have been given by the Lord? Let us learn that we have been given this liberty in order to love our brethren. If there are any among us who have a conviction from the word to decide to keep these ceremonial laws for himself, knowing full well its purpose in pointing him to the sinfulness of sin, let us not tell him not to do so. Let us even eat what he eats in front of him if he would be stumbled by our eating. This is what the Apostle Paul taught the church at Rome, which had a mixed congregation of both Jews who sought to be obedient to the ceremonial law and Gentiles who needed not to. This we see if we go to Romans. Let's go to Romans. This is the other passage we shall read. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 to 15 verse 7. Romans chapter 14 verse 1 to 15 verse 7. This is Paul saying to the Roman Christians, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judges another's man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. From this we see that both those that eat and those that do not eat, as they do it to the Lord, they are accepted of him. Verse 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. 
But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an, an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know, and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus, that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offence. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches on them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. This is what we are supposed to do. We are to edify one another. We are to be of one mouth and one mind, serving the Lord together. Let us learn to do so. Let us learn not to harm the conscience of our brethren. We have been freed from bondage not to take advantage of others, but for us to willingly love our brethren as Christ has loved them. Therefore, let us do as Paul says, as we examine this book of Leviticus, remember this clearly from chapter 15 and verse 5. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. All the books of the Old Testament for that is the scriptures that Paul is referring to. Though it was mainly written in the land of Israel, it was written as much for Gentiles as for Jews. And this means that the book of Leviticus, though we are at liberty not to keep the ceremonial laws that are in it, yet God has inspired and preserved it for us that we may draw out its lessons, that we may obtain patience and comfort as we journey through this life, expecting with great hope of the glorious future that is to come. Therefore, Paul was also able to say to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 to 17 regarding the Scriptures, that all Scripture, which is the Old Testament and the New Testament, a part of it that only had been written, is given by inspiration of God 
and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This means that God has given us the book of Leviticus to learn doctrine, to know truth, to be reproved when we have strayed, to be corrected that we may know the right way to go, and for instruction so that we may continue on this path of righteousness. And Leviticus will completely equip us to do so, to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. This is especially needful to remember as we go now to Leviticus 12. For in Leviticus 12, we shall find truths contained in it that may be displeasing to our culture and may even be displeasing to us. But let us remember who we are approaching before. We are approaching before the Holy One. And it is not He who needs to conform to us, it is us who need to conform to Him. May He help us to do so as we consider the defilement that has come upon the nature of men, both of male and of female. That's our first point. Notice each gender's defilement. In Leviticus chapter 12 and verses 1 to 5, notice that regardless of gender, both are conceived in uncleanness. Let's see from verses 1 to 5. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. According to the days of the separation for her infirmity, shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary, until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her separation. And she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. <clears throat> Both are born in uncleanness, regardless of their gender. For the depravity of our nature is not tied to one gender more than the other. Both are born in uncleanness. And for the mother that bore them, cleansing is required. Does not this describe sin so well? Sin is not just a habit that is picked up along the way. Sin is not something that we only learn throughout our life. It is something that is in us. It is something that is a part of our very nature. We are born with it and we can do nothing to be born without it. And this is why David, earlier in our call to worship, said that in sin did my mother conceive me. In sin did my mother conceive me. For he understood from this text that this was so. And therefore the picture is set forth for the whole family. For the mother would require both days of separation and days of purification to remind the whole family that the child that is born is not as innocent as they think it to be. And sin, with its effects, has corrupted even the generations that came out of their loins. But some of us may ask, how is it fair that when a female is born, the days of the mother's separation and purification are longer as compared to the males? Are the males seen to be more clean than the females, or the females more unclean than the males? Let us not come to God with such an attitude. Let us be ready to hear what His Word has to say. Let us note first that the distinction between the male and the female is found in terms of their function. In verse 2, the male is called a man-child, and in verse 5, the female is called a maid-child. Later on, in verse 6, when the purifying is being spoken of, 
then they are referred to as, as son or daughter. And at the end, later in the end of verse 7, it says a male or female. But now it is in terms of their function in verses 1 to 5. For the male, as the head, is the one who is circumcised in verse 3. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And the handmaid is the one who supports the head, for she is the one who bears the next generation, who continues in their uncleanness. But there is hope, even in the continuity of uncleanness. For what is the point of circumcision? As we saw in Genesis, it is the token of the covenant that was made with Abraham, that God would not only be Abraham's God, but he will also be the God of his seed. This we see if we go to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17 and verses 7 to 11. Genesis chapter 17 and verses 7 to 11. God says to Abraham, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. What a comfort this is for those who experience the same depravity in our nature. For though our children are born in sin, they are also born with hope. Hope in the covenant-keeping God, who in the church age has given baptism as a sign of the covenant, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And this is our second point, rejoice in the same atonement. Such a hope that we have brings about joy, for we who are depraved in our nature have an atonement prepared for us. So if we go back to Leviticus 12 and verses 6 to 7, it says, And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that have borne a male or a female. It doesn't matter whether it be a male or a female, whether a son or a daughter, the atonement is the same atonement. The cleansing is as full a cleansing whether the babe that is born be a male or a female, a son, or a daughter. Take comfort, all mothers, you who feel most greatly the pains of childbearing. Know this, that the effects of the curse can be atoned for through the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sacrifices through the burnt and the sin offering will rise as a sweet savour to the Lord as you look towards the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And therefore the covenant children of God are baptised in hope, hope of the goodness of God and His covenant with His people. And our third point, appreciate its equity. The atonement is not only for those who can afford to bring a lamb and a young pigeon, for look at the provision that is provided in verse 8. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, 
Then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons, the one for burnt offering and the other for sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her and she shall be clean. Even if you don't have money to bring a lamb, you can bring two turtle doves or two pigeons for the atonement of the Lord is available for all. And the cleansing is as complete whether a lamb is sacrificed or a pigeon is sacrificed. Thus it is with our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not whether we are male or female. It's not whether we are rich or poor. It only matters that we acknowledge that we are unclean, that we have no help in ourselves, but must come to the heavenly tabernacle with the precious blood of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And there we may find forgiveness freely given to us, and we may freely receive of it. Let us therefore be emboldened by this truth. Shall we be afraid to reach out to any man or woman? Shall we be afraid because they are somebody big, somebody great? Or are they too little for us that we despise them? No, let us not have such an attitude. Let us tell all men that they are born in sin. Let us all tell women, all women, that they are born in sin. Let us tell them that there is an atonement that is available for their uncleanness. Let us tell them about our Lord Jesus, who we who have tasted and known of His cleansing power that has freed us from the bondage of sin. Let us be freed so that we may serve. Let us do so today to proclaim the gospel to all the peoples of the world. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank Thee for the comfort from Thy word. We acknowledge our depravity, but we also acknowledge Thy covenant. Thou who hast called us Thine own, would Thou help us to be emboldened by this truth? Would Thou help us to find comfort and hope in Thy word? For we have atonement that is available for all of us. And give us grace that we may share this with others. This we ask and pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.